Uh, good morning. Sorry for the delay um, because we had some issues with the AV setup. Uh, I think with, uh, um, we should, we'll start very soon. Uh, let's just introduce our speaker. Rajesh is a professor uh, of information systems at Singapore Management University, and uh, his res research interest in, is, is broadly in mobile systems, but in particular in making them scale to realistic applications. So he has um, uh, that, uh, built systems that can do uh, passive sensing at the scale of a conference center, resort island, or a university. And uh, today he'll actually tell us about one application of this uh, in a university campus. Uh, but he's also he's also done work. So we'll start actually with that. Okay. So get you later. Thank you, Rajesh. Okay. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, hope everyone you confirmed everyone can hear right online, Francisco. Okay, uh, morning folks, thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, some work I've done with my student, Camelia, who's now uh, Dr. Camelia, she just graduated, she's my postdoc, together with a colleague, uh, Yonggi, who's at Seoul National University on detecting stress and depression using passive Wi-Fi. Okay, so first to set the context, right, because this is NIH. This is tested only on undergraduates in Singapore. It's not a dormitory campus, so they don't stay on campus. Because of the nature of the cost load, they can spend anywhere from eight to 24 hours on campus sometimes, right? The university we, we are in follows an American schedule with uh, people declaring majors the same way a US university would do it and cost layout. All the work here is not diagnosis. There is no medical diagnosis involved at all. What I'm showing you is purely predictive models. We make predictions, all ground through from self-assessed surveys. Right, so let's put that in context. There's no medical work being shown here at all. And there's no interventions performed, all those are future work. Everything here so far is predictions. Okay, so let me go and talk a bit about what we are doing. What we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how we can detect stress and depression among an undergraduate population as easily as possible. That is the key, right? The key is ease. And the second one is also accuracy. So how is this being done in the past? Well, first and foremost, we have the psychiatric methods, which is to use surveys. You know, for stress, there's a survey by Cohen, the PSS, Perceived Stress Score, which was done in 1994. For depression, that's a very well-known PHQ by Spitzer, which came out in 1999, and that's actually a diagnostic tool, right? But those, are, those require active intervention, as in you need to give it to everybody and everyone has to do it. So it's actually a very, it's quite an invasive step, right? And it requires you to actually comply and actually want to do it. So recently, there's been a lot of work in how we can use mobile systems to actually detect some of these things automatically. So I'll cover a bit of that history and show where we are now. Okay, so first and foremost, there's a couple of work uh, that came out a few years ago at various conferences that uh, basically can apply, this, this icon means they can apply to large numbers of population, and they are mostly diagnostic. They, they basically give you a sense of the entire campus as to what is the campus feeling, you know? Are they feeling happy? Are they feeling sad? Things like that, right? And it's all done by a phone application. So in these cases, what happens is they're collecting movement traces, acceleration, calendar, things like that, and they're trying to get a sense for the mood of the environment. Right? So not individuals, but more global moods. Taking that further, there was some work that came out of Dartmouth. Student Life is a very uh, famous project that has a lot of full-on work from Dartmouth, led by Andrew Campbell. That is actually, and that's also the two papers here, that actually gave, uh, collects data using a, a specific smartphone app. And it also scales to large numbers of people, it's basically whoever installs the app. And they are also trying now to actually do detection of specific traits, in this case, depression. Right? They're trying to detect it. But again, they're trying to do it at a broad level. They're not just doing general sentiments, they're trying to actually detect a specific condition, but doing it across large aggregate populations. Now, what happens if you actually want to do individuals? Well, that's the next set of work, right? Next set of work, which you notice the date, some of them overlap, but generally you see a progression forward. It's people trying to detect individuals as to how they can actually say this particular person is stressed or this particular person is depressed, right? And in these cases, they all were aiming for uh, stress. Some of them are doing depression, but again, they're using mobile apps. Right? And I'll explain what the issue with mobile apps is in the next slide. It's actually a very big issue if you're trying to do mobile apps, especially for this particular condition, right? which I'll explain. And finally, we have people who are trying to do it without any use of apps. And this is more recent, and our work falls in the space too. 
where they're trying to use Wi-Fi generally, and they're trying to detect the entire environment and saying, you know, these are the people who are depressed, these are the people who are stressed. Our work is similar to this uh, prior work, and we, we are done in the same time period, except our results are better, right? And we can detect a lot more than they can. But they are similar, we're using similar ideas, right? Just our mechanisms are different. Okay, now let me go into what makes this problem particularly hard. So this is a sense of the related work. Any questions? And no, feel free to jump in anytime you want, info, including the folks on uh, WebEx. If you type a question, Francisco will re relate to me. So don't feel shy, right? This is not a wait till I finish and ask everything. Ask me anything you want, right? Anytime you want, very interactive. Okay, so some of the key challenges is that if you wanna do this, you have to do it at scale. Because as you all know, the population is large, especially on campuses, right? And it's very, very hard to say these are the people you want to monitor because the, if, especially when you're dealing with mental health, it could be anyone, literally. So you really want to get as many people as possible. So you need a way to scale. And if you want to scale, it has to be non-invasive. It has to be easy for a person to opt in to the point where it doesn't, they don't even have to do much, right? You then want to be able to detect things that are actually useful, Right. The problem with scalability, scalability usually is the opponent of accuracy. The more you scale, the less accurate you become, right? But at the same time, you want to be able to be very accurate with these conditions because we're not dealing with uh, things that are, you know, we can make mistakes. These things are quite serious, so you have to be quite accurate at the same time as well. And finally, you have to make sure you do not require people to install any kind of app. Because unfortunately, the moment you require any kind of step like an app, you have already lost the population that you actually want to target. Because when you're dealing with, you know, this is what we learned the hard way in Singapore. If you're dealing with issues like mental health, the folks who actually come for help already are far ahead of those that you actually want to find. The ones you actually want to find will never ask for help because either they, they don't want to ask or they don't even know they need to ask, right? So they will not install apps, they will not talk to counselors, they will not tell their friends anything, they just go on as though they're normal and in the end, nobody knows anything different, right? So how do you do it in a way so that you don't actually require somebody to take a first positive step, right? Because for conditions like this, it's actually very hard to even say I need help. That's the first step. Those that actually say it are ahead of the curve in many ways. So we decided, you know, how can we do this without even using apps and we can scale the whole environment, right? So. Like I've already mentioned the things I just pointed out, you know, we need to operate without requiring additional devices. We need to uh, be able to do many different attributes and we have to do a binary classification even to detect users even if they're anonymous, right? Even if we don't know who they are, we still need to be able to say something so that we can then attempt to provide them the help they need, okay? This, this whole project comes up with my experiences of being an educator for over well, about 15 years now and not being able to help students. So, you know, how do you actually give them the help they need so that they don't actually do crazy things later? Okay, so the key component system, right, is shown in this slide. That's it. The only thing we collect as input for our system is the signal strength of your phone connected to the Wi-Fi network. And we collect this information from the Wi-Fi network itself. So nothing is installed on your phone. Nothing, you don't have to do anything. You just have to be connected to the Wi-Fi network and we pull the data directly from the Wi-Fi network itself. We work with commercial grade enterprise uh, Wi-Fi, so we work with Aruba. We, our system supports Aruba, supports Cisco, supports a few others, right? We pull the data directly from the controller, as they say. And this comes from a line of work I've done on indoor location and uh, Wi-Fi analytics. All of that information then goes into a system that my group has built over the years called LifeLabs that actually extracts the RSSI information does very, very interesting triangulation, trilaterations to figure out exactly where in the physical space that device is located, right? And then it goes into another piece of work that we, my students built years ago called Groomon, which is a group detector, which basically then identifies you as part of a group with other devices. So even though there's 10 of you in this room, it will eventually say the two of you are together or the five of you are together. It actually is able to very accurately say which devices are moving together with the same intent, as in it puts people into logical groups. It doesn't know what the purpose of the group is, because remember all we get is Wi-Fi signals, but it knows that these people are in a group, right? Then from these two pieces of information, we then do a lot of machine learning. Yes? Uh, what's the spatial and temporal resolution of the localization of each person? 
for the deployments we have, we get an update every five seconds. Every five seconds for every device. Spatial precision for the environments we're in is usually anywhere from three to 10 meters. For my campus, it's three to five meters. So the accuracy is within three to five meters. It's definitely room level, uh, usually better than that, and every five seconds. Okay. Yes? Did you get Okay, the question is, could I get a metric of traffic from each device? No, because all we get is the RSSI information. We know nothing about what the device is sending or what it's actually doing. We have no other information other than the signal strength or, or as in how strong your signal is as seen by the AP. We have no idea what apps you're running. We have no idea what data you're sending. None of that. We don't get any data packets. Right? So it's a very, very weak signal that we are getting but we get it from every device. And from there, we're inferring a lot of stuff, right? So the first thing we're inferring is your location through a lot of uh, interesting mathematics. And from then on top of that, from all the locations, we're inferring which groups you're part of and how your group dynamics actually change. And then after that, we go to the next part. And from there, we pull out a lot of machine learning labels, like are the locations you're in work-related? Are they fun-related or are they unknown, right? So what we've done is we've, stratify the campus to different areas. So if you're in a seminar room, that's work-related. If you're in the canteen, that's usually fun-related, although canteen, sometimes people do work. If you're in the library, it's usually work-related, and some places are considered mixed, right? The gym is almost always fun. You know, nobody studies in the gym, as far as you can tell, right? So things like that, right? So we, based on the location, we have different labels of what people are doing in that area, and then we create all kinds of attributes. We actually have about 50, 60 attributes that we create on top of that. And then we throw them into uh, different classifiers. We have two different classifiers for stress and depression. They are completely different because as I'll show you, show you later, we have also validated the conventional wisdom that stress and depression are not correlated. Yep. They are somewhat correlated, but they're not correlated in many people. So you need different classifiers for both of them because they do behave quite differently. And in the end, we are doing a binary classification to make things easier. We are spitting out labels, uh, depressed, not depressed, highly stressed, not stressed. Okay. And I would like to state that what we are doing is, in many ways, is we are finding outliers. So when I say stress, I'm not saying that whether you're stressed or not, because it's a student environment. Everybody's going to be stressed when the exam period is coming around. We are finding the people who are significantly more stressed than the rest. Right? So keep that in mind. When I say stress, I don't mean are you stressed or not. Stress is not a bad thing. Right? Everybody on campus is stressed at different points in time. It is the ones who are more stressed than the rest that we are trying to highlight. Right? Because excessive stress, especially excessive prolonged stress, is the issue. Right? Okay. So let me go into what type of features we actually pull out, right? because some of you will be quite interested in this. So we actually... Uh, pulled out our features based on what we collected from the students. Before we conducted the study, we actually talked to students and got demographic information about what they actually do on campus. We actually got some basic you know, insights into how students spend their time on campus, you know, where they go for meals, where they go to study, et cetera. We got the official university calendar, et cetera. You know, which rooms are used for what, what's the holidays, et cetera. And based on all of that, we actually break buildings up into various areas. Right? We break it up into gym, eat, no study areas, seminar. CCAs is co-curricular activities. This is their extracurricular activities, you know, dance clubs, things like that. And this, you know, that's why I want to walk around. The thing on the top left-hand corner is the actual input we get from the uh, access point. That is all we get from the access point. We get a timestamp, we get a device MAC, we get a RSSI value, and then our system attends a location code and a last seen time after we have processed it. Right? But the only thing we get from the access point is timestamp, device MAC, and RSSI. And then our system goes and appends a location after going and doing all our, our magic. Okay? The group detector then spits all these things out and says, you know, how big a group are you in? And we have stratified the group into uh, four different sizes, individuals, medium, small, and large. And this uh, heuristics are based on our own personal experience with how people move around on campus. This will change depending on which campus you're on. Right? So all of these features are campus dependent. But the good thing is you only do it once for each campus. Right? It's a one-time thing. It is not student dependent. It is not co-op dependent. It is campus dependent. And until they change the purpose of the campus, these things will remain quite stable. 
Okay, and the last thing we do is we also figure out what they are doing in any particular room, you know. So what is the task type, you know, what's the start time, end time, number of attendees, and the venue. And this we get from our location data. Right? We don't have input to the calendar or anything like that. All we have is location data. And we have the campus uh, calendar. So we have external data because the campus schedule is quite fixed. You know, we talked about that yesterday. The campus calendar is quite fixed as to which classes go on in which rooms. Right? So we know that. Okay. So based on all of that, we actually compute two different sets of metrics. We have learned, so in some sense, you know, one of the big insights we learned from doing this project is that if you want to, and this is why we differ from previous work. Previous work, a lot of previous work actually try to classify a person based on some kind of societal norm, right? They say, okay, you are stressed because you don't match these societal norms or something like that. We are taking a different approach. We're saying every person is an individual. Their levels are very different from somebody else, you know? If you classify an extrovert with, against an introvert, of course they're going to get issues, and vice versa. So what we do is we create a model for every single person. And at the start of the semester, the model is learning their behavior and setting out what it considers to be normal for them. Then during the course of semester, we actually compare their behavior with what we actually train for them, and the system flags out things that are considered anomalous. So it's your change of your own behavior. But to actually normalize the whole thing, we also have what we call relative aggregates. You know, I can't, does the mouse actually work? Maybe, okay. Okay, so what we have is we have absolute uh, metrics, which is basically you against yourself, and we have relative metrics, which is you against your cohort, right? And we also, because it's important to see two types of deviations. If you are normal compared to yourself, but you're not normal compared to your cohort, that's also a problem. If you are normal to, to your cohort, but you're changing based to yourself, that's also a problem, right? So we're looking at two different dimensions, right? Because we want to make sure we don't get any outliers. Yes, sorry. The cohort, is it a global cohort, or is it a cohort that you build by, by grouping different individuals together? So it's like different from life, life as an individual, or that's actually a very good question. For our studies, we only, the court is defined as the people in our study, but when we operationalize this, it could be in many different ways. It could be your class, it could be your year, it could be your section, it could be the whole student population, it could be your major, we don't know. To be honest, this is one of the things that, <coughs> this is still preliminary work, we've only tested it with about 110 students, but if we actually deploy this university-wide, we deploy this university why who your cohort is is actually quite an interesting question. I have a hacking cough because I was in a place that was quite polluted last week and I'm still I'm still getting on with that. <coughs> so that's what I've actually explained. The words actually say what I've just explained, right? We are checking your behavior relative to yourself and also relative to your cohort. Because we found from our own uh, experimental evidence that just doing one or the other leads to a lot of errors. The false positive rate is actually very high, right? If because you against yourself, you might not show any behavior, especially if you're trained against, in, at a time when the person's already afflicted, right? But you against your cohort shows a lot of false positive because nobody, a lot of individuals are very different from their cohort, right? And that just flags out lots of random things, which is why a lot of previous work fails as well. <coughs> they try to create some kind of global notion of normal, which doesn't work. Okay. So to talk a bit about the user study that we did, uh, we had three user studies. Our primary study was actually done with information system sophomores, about 60-something uh, people, 62, about even mix of uh, men and women. And it was during an entire 14-week semester. Right, we, we, we tracked them from start to finish, the entire semester. And they were all doing a semester-long project. So there was many cases for them to get a lot of stress. And that is what we used as to actually build our study and validate everything. To validate our results, we then did two additional studies where we used our trained models from the first study to see if it would actually work with other students in different cohorts. And these students were a mix of different majors. Right? It was, we managed to get less students, only about 40-something students, <coughs> but they came from six different majors. Right? They were doing six different course modules. Whereas the first study was just all IS students doing one course, right? So we also wanted to see if our models were stable across different cohorts, because that's very important, right? You need some kind of uh, between subjects validation as well. And again, uh, most of them was, uh, were done for 14 weeks. Some of them were only done for half a semester, 30 days. Okay, now this is the part that I just wanted to put in just to show you all how we did it. 
One of the things that if you all do user studies and you all actually need people to provide survey data, one of the hardest things to do is to make sure that your participants provide the survey data on time and accurately. Right? It's very, very tedious to keep sending them emails. So the way we overcame this is this was done by, my, by Camila, my postdoc. It was a brilliant idea. She actually built a web app that shows up very nicely on phones, and this actually connects directly to, our, to Qualtrics or Google Forms at the back. So if you're using Qualtrics, it just plugs in the Qualtrics. If it does Google Forms, it pulls to that. And it shows them clearly which surveys they have done and which they have not. And most importantly, this slide, right? This, it has a couple of, uh, it has a couple of components. This one shows what they have done and what they have not. This is most important. It shows them what they have earned and what they have not earned by not doing the survey. This turned out to increase participation rates amazingly high. Right? Uh, a lot of our social science colleagues actually want us to give them access to this app now, just so that they can use this to motivate their students. It turns out they're just showing people how much they are earning and how much they would lose if they don't finish the service. It's a great tool to get them to submit surveys on time. Now, does it change the nature of the responses? We don't know, but at least they provide them. You will still need, you will still need other tools in place to make sure their surveys are provided accurately, because they might just go into the motions. Right? But this, this increased the retention rate quite, quite well, and it made sure people were doing their surveys on time. Okay? And what were some of the things we actually asked them to do? We asked them to uh, provide demographic surveys at the start, which is social education, big five personality traits. You know, we had their mobile Mac, we had their work group schedule, and every three days they were going to give us ground truth, which is the PSS for stress levels, and every two weeks they were doing the PHQ-8 for depression. And at the end, we, and and then two times in the semester, we did semi-structured interviews just to understand what was going on, right? Just for us to understand. These were not really rigorous. They were semi-structured just to make sure that what we are seeing was actually accurate, <coughs> okay? So to give a better idea of the surveys, just in case you all don't know what they are, the perceived stress score, the perceived stress scale, the PSS4, is a scale of 0 to 16. Uh, it's extensively tested on student and employee, and it's been translated in many languages. This is not a diagnostic tool. This is important. The perceived stress scale is not a diagnostic tool. It cannot be used to determine the source of stress. And, you know, at some level, we were trying to figure out what cutoff would indicate severe stress. So what we did is we took the mean. This is reported in prior work, what they found the mean score to be. And then we took two standard deviations above that. Right? So it turned out to be 12.36. And that was the number that we put as severe stress. So we are being very pessimistic as well. So all the results we're showing for severe stress are very pessimistic, right? So that's the other thing that also needs to be tuned. We have taken what was considered the average, and we have taken two standard deviations beyond that. Yeah. So anybody whose severe uh, PSS score indicates a score of above 12.36 would be marked as severely stressed, right? From the ground truth labels, the system itself does it a completely different way, using all the classifiers and machine learning labels that I told you about, right? This is just our ground truth labels. For the depression score, we're using the patient health questionnaire, the PHQ. We are using the PHQ-8. Some of you might have uh, been more familiar with PHQ-9. We do not use the ninth question because it, uh, it pertains to, to three sites. And we were told, you know, all these studies were done with a lot of social science scientists' help and, of course, and some psychiatrists. We also consulted with psychiatrists, uh, psychiatrists in Singapore's version of the NIH, the Institute of Mental Health. And they said, please don't use the ninth because you are not able to deal with anybody who answers that question positively. Right? So we dropped the ninth question, so we're using the PHQ-8. Right? And the PHQ-8, even without the ninth question, is still a di clinical diagnosis tool. Uh, it has been validated in many different uh, clinical environments around the world, and the numbers are very clear. Anything above 10 indicates depression, yeah? which should be diagnosed by a psychiatrist after that. But it is, it is indicative of that. So that's the numbers we use based on prior work. Okay. So any questions about the scales? Because those, these form our ground truth, right? The way the system detects it is using just the RSSI indicators that I told you about, right? The ground truth is invisible to the system. It doesn't have any access to the survey data. Okay. So let me go through some of the hypotheses that we saw, right? I'll show you some of the data because this is where it gets more interesting as to what we actually saw. So the first hypothesis, obviously, is the base hypothesis, right, is that you can detect stress and depression using location data. We didn't believe it could be done either, right? But it turns out it can. A person's behavior does subtly change 
when they experience significant amounts of stress or depression. And we actually did prove that, as we'll see in the results. But some other hypothesis that came out of that is students with severe stress spend fewer hours on campus. This is a hypothesis that was given to us by our, uh, by our psychology colleagues, that you know, if you're highly stressed, you want to go away as much as possible. You want to go away from the source of stress. Right? And we didn't actually see too much of this. We saw some of it, but it wasn't that pronounced as we thought. And it could be because some of the stress was actually not coming from school. It could be from other places, because again, we don't know the source of stress right, in some of these places. So there is some, there is some, we didn't actually figure out where the source of stress was in some of these cases. Right? Another hypothesis we had is that people with severe stress participate less in work-related activities. You know, they just don't want to do anything because they're just so stressed. And this one, yeah, we did, we did see this. Right? We saw clear proof, we, we, we found clear signs that if you're highly stressed, you tend to participate less in work activities. Right? This has uh, been shown in other studies as well, but we kind of validated this as well in a student population. So this has implications for work organizations, et cetera, on how to handle, how to manage your employees. Right? <clears throat> and finally, you know, students with uh, severe stress participate more in software engineering. This was the course they were taking. Would they participate more or would they participate less? And it turns out that it was uneven again, right? The, the, the dotted line is actually normal stress. The straight lines are all, uh, uh, the, the, sorry. This is why I wanted to walk around. So the dotted line is all those with uh, normal stress and the solid line is severe stress. These, these are people with high stress. These are people with low stress. And we have two scales on both sides, right? But the important thing is to just see the shape of the curve. They look like the curves follow each other. So it's not really proven either in this hypothesis. Okay. So this curve, this graph is actually interesting, which is why I wanted to show it. Uh, it's actually hard to explain. That's why I wanted to come to the screen to actually show it, but we need to be at the mic. On the x-axis here are labels, are anonymous labels for students that actually showed signs of depression somewhere along their <laughs> Somewhere along their part, they actually indicated that they were depressed. On the y-axis is the days of the week, uh, days of the study, so this is going down in time. And the colored bars show when the depression has actually occurred, right? We have three colors. Uh, stress, is the, stress is this color here, and depression is this color or this color. This is, uh, this is severe, this is mild based on the PHQ, right? But both of these are problematic. What is important to note is these two places, right? We see somebody with severe depression, but they don't indicate they're stressed at all. And this is self-reported. And then they say they're fine. You know, I don't have any stress, but I'm really depressed, right? And this is self-indicated. And then we see the opposite here for another participant who says, hey, I actually, I'm, actually, I'm actually stressed, but I'm not depressed. Right? We see that here too. Right? This person, person in particular, I'm very stressed, but I'm not depressed. Right? Their score indicates that they're not depressed, but they're very stressed. So this actually cor uh, corroborated our decision to have two different classifiers, because even though this is known in many different pieces of literature, we showed it again that stress and depression are not correlated. Now, a lot of people think they are, but they're not. Right? And we, it was very uh, revealing to us when we saw this data that even when people are self-reporting, they're reporting different things, okay? Uh, so how did we actually evaluate our system? What we did is that we took the study data and then we did the standard machine learning. You know, we created a training set, we created a test set, uh, and then we used the second study as purely as a test set against the model that's actually trained previously, right? So just to see if our data was, ro if our models are robust with a different data set. And then we actually looked at all the, mod, the attributes, you know, true positive, true negative, uh, false positive, all those things, right? And the first question we needed to answer <coughs> is our prediction window size. This is important because models change depending on how much data you give to them. So what is the length of the window of the data that will actually give us the best predictors for both stress and depression? It turns out they're significantly different, by the way. Right? Stress. Stress is much, much easier to detect because it's a much, you know, we looked at the literature, even the psychiatrist told us the same thing. Stress is much, much faster to manifest itself. It's also much, much faster to disappear. 
because it's actually easier to handle, right? So what we found is that for stress, the top features that work for stress are location data, and the biggest, uh, the biggest non-work-related features were the amount of time they spent studying and the amount of time they spent by themselves. These turned out to be the best predictors for stress among all the attributes we use, right? How much time they spend studying, how much time they spend by themselves, right? How much time they spend by themselves could be both a positive and negative indicator, by the way, depending on the type of person. Yeah. And what we found out is that for stress, the best window for us for this particular data set and student population was six days. So we make a prediction every six days would give us the highest uh, true positive rate at 98.93. But which is slightly lower than three days, but then the true negative rate was much higher, right, at six days. So we decided to err on that side of caution, right? So we picked six days because it gives the best bet against uh, false and negative results. So every six days for stress. Yep. But then what about depression? Depression, it turns out that users, are, for depression, it turns out the best predictors is how much time they spent in a group. Right? It's not how much time they spent studying. Studying was okay, but it's mostly how much time they spent in a group. It was a very strong indicator of depression. Because as we found out, extroverts, when they get depressed, tend to become introverted and vice versa. An introvert that doesn't spend any time with people will suddenly end up being in crowded places, even though they're not really talking to anyone. They just want to be in crowded places. Now their behavior fundamentally changes in that sense. And for depression, we also found we needed much longer windows. So through our study, we actually found we needed a 15-day windows. And this was uh, corroborated by a psychiatric friend who said, yeah, depression takes much longer to, do, to manifest itself. Right? It's not something that triggers that quickly. So you need a longer observation period to be able to see it manifesting. So even though stress was six days, depression was 15 days. And the numbers are 70% because this was done with a very simple classifier. We actually improved our classifier by including the personality scores. And you'll see the final results in the next slide. Right, this is the final results. So for perceived stress, we actually used uh, all the features. You know, our algorithms are random for us, six-day intervals. And for all the population, our, our true positive rate is about 96%, right? Our true negative rate, about 80%, which is pretty good, considering we're only using RSSI, right? The only input we're getting is a weak uh, radio signal. And we are doing it across the entire population. Right, for depression, we actually had to include one of the personality metrics. I think it was a neurotism score in particular, was highly in predictive of depression. We, have, we are still investigating why is that particular trait in the big five. The others did not actually help that much. And in the end, when we did our best, when we added everything together, for depression, we are about 91% accurate. Our true negative rate is Pretty, it's not as good as we would like at 66%, but our true positive rate is actually pretty high, right? So the folks we actually detect are pretty good. The ones we actually don't, yeah, we have some issues there. But we are very happy that at least we are detecting a large number of people who actually do need help. So in both cases, you notice that for valid A, which is one of the population sets we did very poorly, and that's because we misclassified one sample for one of them. And for the second case, the, we didn't have enough data. Remember, our windows are 15-day our six, 15 day windows, and we only had 30 days of data for valid A because there was a shorter time period. So the classification rate was actually terrible, right? So for depression, one of the takeaways we had is that you need a longer observation period. You can't do it quickly. But if you can study people over a semester, you have a very good chance of getting very high accuracy in figuring out who needs help at the end of the semester or even during the semester. When we, showed this to our, when we showed this to our counselors, they were very happy. But again, comes to the next question, right, which I'm sure some of you are thinking, how would you operationalize this, right? It's, all I've talked to you right now is detection. Detection is important, but detection is only 20% of the problem. Intervention is the other 80, right? You need to actually do something about it. Just knowing somebody needs help and not doing something about it is terrible. You need to actually do something about it. How would you actually do something about it? Well, it turns out that's really tricky, right? And this is where we, I'm actually working with a whole bunch of very smart colleagues on this. Yeah. So to actually, uh, some of the things we actually do to make sure that we are doing this ethically is we are hashing all the MAC addresses. You know, for our study, everybody consented, everybody opted in. This is all IRB approved, by the way. 
right? Everything I've shown you here is IRB approved. This IRB approval actually is very easy because we are only doing detection, right? There's no harm to the subject at all. Once we do interventions, that will go through a full board, right? And probably a medical board as well. Yeah. Uh, and we're also engaging with educators and health professionals. You know, my team, my, my research team right now has a couple of uh, lawyers as well who are very excited at the legal challenges being raised by things like this. But it's a very important problem, right, which I'll explain in the next slide. Yeah. So some of the things you want to do is you want to passively support anonymous users in the greatest help. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to do interventions. And one of the key ideas we have is not to target individuals. Because these kind of systems are all probabilistic, which means there's still a small chance you made an error. Right? If you made an error and you, and you do the wrong intervention, you could make things much worse. Right? The health professionals are very clear about this. So what we are thinking about is how can we do group interventions? Right? How can we target the entire class? How can we target a whole you know, CCA? How can we target a cohort? And in, instead get everybody up right? and improve everybody at the same time. So that is some of the things that we're trying to do, yeah? And also for uh, teamwork and collaboration, we're trying to figure out how we can use this to actually create better teams, because one of the biggest reasons for stress that was coming out from the students was having to work with people who do not share the same interest as them, right? And interest is academic interest or goal interest, right? It's very, very annoying for them to work with people who are not goal aligned with them. Whether the, some of them, the pro, you know, this shows up in this thing right here. The people who are the highly stressed, if the leader was highly stressed, the rest of the team would just let them get away with anything because they depend on the leader to get things done. But if a junior member was highly stressed, the rest of the team would just let them have it, which makes things worse, actually. Right? So there was a big imbalance in how different people were managed within the team depending on who actually became stressed or even depressed. And these things need to sort themselves out because students can make things worse. This is what we le learned in teams, right? They are not professionals. They just lash out, and they can make things worse, either by letting it faster or by, or by doing strange things to people who need help. Okay? So moving forward, right, what do we do next? Well, obviously, we can make the model better, but at some level, it's good enough to do uh, better things now. But we do want to improve it as much as possible, you know, being putting on my computer science hat. But the... <clears throat> More interesting questions all come from the social science domain. You know, how do you actually measure group phenomena? You know, how do you actually identify social identification? This system can actually be used to do social identification, which is how do you figure out who is included in a group and who is not and why? Right? That's a very uh, hot topic in Singapore right now because of we are a small country and we have immigration. We are, we are an immigrant nation, right? And we're trying to figure out how to get our new immigrants to integrate with our older immigrants. Right? You all have the same issue here, but you're a much larger country, so it's not as in your face as we are in a small country. So we are trying very hard to make sure that systems, the society is united. So how do you do it, right? How do you even do it in schools? Yeah? How do you do intervention? This is very important. How do you do individuals when necessary for specific individuals, but mostly group level or even passive? Right? How do you help people without them even knowing that you're helping them? Right? Because the whole nature of help is that if they know they're being helped, you know, they may not want it in some cases. So my psychology friends are very excited by this. They're already hard at work thinking about what kind of interventions they could do, right? How do you expand this to other workplace settings? I've had many, I've had quite a few workplaces ask whether they could deploy this to figure out the stress and stress levels of their employees because as you see, you know, when employees get stressed, they don't work as hard. This is a billion dollar loss to them in some places. You know, the global economy loses trillions of dollars due to people being highly stressed and taking sick leave, et cetera. So companies have asked, can they use this? And I said no, because I do not have any mechanism in place to prevent companies from firing their employees when they find out they're highly stressed or for penalizing them in some way. That's why I'm working with students, because in students, it's harmless. You know, we, universities only will help their students. They'll help them, they, either they go see counselors, et cetera, they leave, nothing follows them. There's no record that follows them, everything's confidential, right? So it's a clean slate once they leave. That cannot be said for workplaces. Right? So that's why I'm not using this to even do staff or faculty in the university, even though they need it as well, yeah? because there is an employment contract there. Which leads to the last point, which is the public policy for systems like this. Now, this is why my law friends are very ha happy to work with me. I'm like giving them all kinds of new toys to play with, right? And my social science colleagues, I'm like the arms dealer. I give them ways to scale all their techniques to large population sizes. 
but how do you actually develop policy for this kind of large-scale environmental sensing? Because this is large-scale environmental sensing, the sensors in the environment. You may or may not have opted in, but it's still sensing you. And it's, decide, it's, it's putting labels on you that you may or may not want. But what is the laws and ethics and privacy considerations that we need for this kind of system? These systems are coming, whether we like it or not, you know? And so we as researchers need to take the lead on this, you know, before we get, uh, before uh, companies and the commercial world decide to do something, right? Because they won't have our best interests in mind. Right? But these systems are coming. You know, we already see it with video analytics, et cetera. But, you know, in this case, we want to help people, but how do we stop it from hurting people as well? If the wrong label gets attached, right? So we need policy. And it has to be done at country level. So in Singapore, we're looking at it, and I hope you all are looking at it as well over here. So future plans, right? I'm going to tell you we have three more deployments underway. Uh, in January, we will have a 500-student trial in a polytechnic. And these students are not of legal consent. They're all 18 years or, or younger, so they will need parental consent, which makes things more interesting. But if you all are interested in uh, participating in this trial in January, let us know, because we can find a way to get you all involved. No, we are still formulating the survey implements, et cetera, or what the ground truth data we're going to get, at least 500 students to see if our system works. And this is a whole different educational environment, right? It's not a university, it's a polytechnic, right? We have another trial at a vocational institute, which is 15 to 16 years old. This is a trade school, and they have very different demographics. These, these, this, um, this is not a high-end educational environment. In many ways, it's pretty low-end. So the students here have a very different background. So we expect to go in and find lots of positive hits for stress and depression, and we're trying to figure out how to make that work, right? So it's a very different environment, but it's a very important environment as well. And finally, we have, uh, we have a lot of interest from U.S. universities to do trials, especially from Amherst and some at UW, but these will take some more time to do, and you know, if you all are interested, this might be a place for NIH to get involved because these are U.S. universities. Some of the PIs are also NIH funded for these studies as well. Okay, and that's the last slide I have. If you want to contact me, that's my contact details. If you all uh, have any questions or want to follow up, let me know. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, let's take uh, some online questions first uh, and reverse the order. And then, uh, so if you want to place any questions, please put them on the chat. Yeah, uh, there's, no, there's an online, so you might as well, we might as well start local. And if uh, someone wants to put it online, they can just put it and I'll, I'll slot them in later. Yeah. When, when devices go into low battery mode, do they change the frequency that they connect to the, to the, to the, to the <laughs> Oh, you're asking a very deep technical question. Right. So, devices and Wi Fi, yes. Let me start the rant now. So, Lots of, when they go low battery mode, they do lots of different things, so you won't see the pro packet, so they tend to disappear as well. If they are Apple device, they tend to disappear as well. If they are Samsung device using the latest firmware, they tend to disappear as well, because a lot of devices don't follow the Wi-Fi spec, at least the newer ones, because they want to save power, so they don't send the beacons as often as they should. So we have a lot of uh, smarts in our system to actually do trajectory uh, prediction and things like that to even figure out where the people are. Right, so that's the whole location system. This work assumes the location system is built, but that's my other hat, so. I know, but I'm just wondering if, uh, if that could be a, another feature. So if all of a sudden the student stops, the student phone started dying in the middle of the day, that means that they're, they're getting a blood phone in at night, it, it could be an indicator. No. At least, at, least, at least what we saw as students, students never forget to keep their phone charged. They charge it in. They charge it in in the seminar room. That's PowerPoint under, yeah. right? They never run. They never have a phone without a battery. That's like impossible. The phone is their life. Yeah. We actually remove laptops from our study because we laptops uh, laptops do not show your mobility pattern because nobody turns on the laptop and moves around. Right. So laptops are very easy to figure out because they teleport. You see them appearing, and then they magically appear somewhere else, right? So we actually removed laptops. We only looked at phones. And I, in a, if you were deploying this in a new, new location, and it was, uh, it was feasible to do a full location mapping to determine kind of the purpose of every location, I was thinking that uh, that takes so long, the laptop should determine the 
Sure. So what are you I mean, that's, uh, so the question is how do we do our location, how do we do our semantic map of what a location is used for in new locations? Well, it's really easy. Just by the name of the location, you can do a very good first filter. In the worst case, just put it as mixed and move on. And the system will figure out eventually that if everyone is there at specific times and you're all doing it, will probably be a work-related work event because you'll see regular schedules firstly. Work, workplaces tend to have a very regular schedule. Fun places tend to be more irregular. Generally, from what we've seen. And those can be figured out. It's the ones that are mixed. We try not to make too many mixed because then it just messes up the classifier. If everything is considered mixed. Okay. Questions? questions online, so we're going to end the uh, thing now. Uh, thank you all for attending today. Uh, and if you have any further questions, you have Professor Bellin's contacts, uh, and please do reach out to him. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, once again. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Corbin.